friends, let's talk about the difference between justice and equality. As a person who has always found myself in a weird middle area when it comes to being a member of both enfranchised and disenfranchised groups of society, the topics of social equality and social justice have always been very important to me and caused a lot of angry conversations in my life. I imagine, given that these are important issues that impact most everyone in the country, that I'm not alone in that experience. I think that part of what causes this anger is that people tend to talk about justice and equality as interchangeable terms. And with a quick look at how we use these words, it makes sense that they would become interchangeable. When we think about the word justice, the immediate image that is summoned is an idea of what is right and good. Justice is the way things ought to be when they are not. When we then look at all the evil and harm caused by the arbitrary nature of discrimination of things like sex, race, gender, body type, and more, it is easy to then conclude that justice, meaning the good, the ought, must also include equality, since inequality is so easily wrapped up in the bad and the ought not. But how do we think about justice when we say a phrase like bringing someone to justice? In this case, our sense of justice changes from what that right state of being is to punishment, for not aligning to that previous notion of the right state of being. It changes to imposing harm for that harm that was caused, and it is so inherently natural to think and feel this way that it makes a Christian sentiment like an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind still an audacious and offensive ethic to live by in practical life. When it comes to criminal law, actions an individual can take that cause harm to society in general, we still take this sort of attitude over any other. However, in my short time at Pepperdine Law, I came across a different description of justice that became one of the main heuristic guide phrases in my torts class. To make someone whole. I found this to be an evolution of those two inherent senses of justice coming together. Not really about giving punishment to the offender, but still directed from the offender. This definition of justice seeks to create that state of the good and the ought by restoring the victim. It sees injustice as an act that takes something from the victim, property, human rights, socially guaranteed rights, and others. Justice is thus restoring that condition of the good by, to the closest approximation, undoing that state of affairs that created the bad and the ought not. However, the messy part of this idea is, of course, that you cannot actually undo the wrongs of the past. They are set in stone. Our legal system in the United States, while recognizing this fact of the inability to restore the abstract actual value lost, tries to remedy this fact with a still abstract but semi-functional measure of value, with money. While this sentiment coincides with our capitalistic senses, measuring the good and the bad, harm and virtue, by a number of dollars doesn't really align with our society's moral senses, which disregard a person's wealth in favor of valuing freedom and honesty over other values. When we start quantifying a person's degrees of freedom and ability to be honest by wealth, by social economic factor, people become angry, disgusted, and uncomfortable for a variety of reasons depending on their circumstances in the social economy. Regardless, our legal sense of justice does, in fact, quantify social and economic harms and virtues by the measure of a dollar in the name of practicality. So now that we have a general sense of how our society interprets and uses justice in a practical way, let's look at how equality interacts with our sense of justice. The right to own oneself, also called freedom, sometimes called bodily autonomy, also called marriage equality, underlies most of the rights a person wants to assert for themselves. If you are a slave, in the United States sense of the word, you are owned by another person. You are not free, and thus freedom is the right to own yourself. 
It was an inequality that white people essentially owned every black person in the nation. Then we changed the law, we amended the Constitution, and now slavery is illegal. So we must now have justice, right? By our first definition of the word justice, we have taken a bad state of affairs and turned them into a good state of affairs, right? Yes, we have. At least as a matter of codified law, justice has been made. But what about the second sense of justice? Has anyone been brought to justice? Has anyone been punished? The obvious answer is no. As a matter of legal standards, it is considered unjust to punish a person for actions they took before that action was made illegal. If the legislature passed a law that made sitting at Starbucks for five hours or more illegal, we would consider it extremely corrupt to then charge anyone who had ever sat at Starbucks for so long. So the people who were engaging in the injustice of slavery lose the continued usage of slaves, but legally face no punishment for engaging with injustice. This step, however, goes a bit further than that. It took time for the law to be enforced in accordance with justice. It took time for the law to be enforced at all. It took a hell of a lot of time for the law that guaranteed the right to own oneself to be actually realized in the Civil Rights Act, and then the same processes of not punishing those who participated in injustice before the law and the just enforcement of that law being fully realized had to start again. It would be right to argue that our nation still has not found its way to establishing our second sense of justice on the issue of equality, the punitive sense. Many cities across the nation still follow policies that over-scrutinize and over-patrol impoverished or minority neighborhoods. The prison industrial complex that normally establishes for-profit prisons that are held to capacity quotas and therefore create an incentive for courts to give prison sentences for minor offenses, and that these prison sentences are disproportionate toward being the favored punishment given to minorities, our punitive system still sees color, and, even with regards to hate crime charges, still disproportionately favor whiteness. And I take that statement very seriously. Being of mixed heritage, being both a white man and a black man, and being proud of both of my heritage at once, that statement is serious. Though I am of the opinion that what happens in the courts is primarily a reflection of the attitudes of society, this reality more exposes the discriminatory attitude of the people at large than an inherent defect in the court system. It is, in my opinion, easy to blame systems. Systems are bodiless, guiltless. But every system is made up of people. It is discriminatory attitudes and incentives among those people that embed inequality in the systems. It is just easier to prove that a system is unequal than it is to prove that a person who operates on a bigoted bias is treating people unequally. Given that our punitive sense of justice hasn't been realized with regards to equality, I bet you can guess how the final legal sense of justice is faring in establishing equality. To make a person whole, not just meaning to cease the continued injustice, and not just a punishment of the perpetrator of injustice, but to undo the harm sustained by the victim, using the best means the society has available. And, as I proposed earlier, it appears to be a natural evolution of combining the first sense of justice, creating the good state of affairs, and the second sense of justice, punishing the ones engaged with injustice. This third sense of justice that developed through the courts focuses on attempting to place the victim in the position that they would have been had they never been harmed by injustice in the first place, by replacing the value that was lost. This is easy enough to think of in terms of one victim, one perpetrator, and some damaged or stolen property. Just pay out a dollar amount that equals the property. Add a little more money to cover the punitive sense of justice and make sure the law itself would hold anyone accountable on these same standards and factors, and voila, complete justice in every sense of the word.
But when it comes to the injustice of inequality, this third sense of justice becomes extremely complicated. Who are the victims of inequality in our society? The answer is most of society. Women, minorities, immigrants, felons who've served their times, and even, oftentimes, retired veterans of our military. Our country has more people suffering the historical results of social economic inequality, the historical results of injustice, than we do people who are not, or people who have overcome the poverty and impediment to growth that inequality has created. Our nation's potential for prosperity is crippled by the fact that the majority of people do not have access to the level of opportunity that would have been realized had the injustice of inequality never taken hold in the first place. So why not re-empower society? Let's make these people whole again. How does our country do that? Well, unfortunately, the court's only option is to pay out money damages. In other words, reparations. That poisonous, toxic, disgusting word to the ears of the enfranchised. No one will take my money away. Even if I have no true historical basis to prove that the wealth was not enabled by the discrimination of the past. But if there were a way to fairly and accurately quantify the harm, we could engage in a version of redistribution of wealth that corrects for unjustly obtained gains and unjustly sustained harms. But this is no longer possible, however. Too many decades, centuries, have passed. Too many people have died. Too much money has changed hands. Too many new families and communities have formed. It is statistically impossible. There cannot even be a symbolic gesture at this point, because any symbolic payment of money damages would inevitably give a disproportionate degree of injustice on someone. And further injustice will not create justice. The time for the government to enact justice with regard to equality is lost, at least in the third sense of justice. What then are the avenues available to us to create this third sense of justice for inequality, if not the courts? Unfortunately, that only avenue is ourselves, and accomplishing something that the majority of people who have established real wealth in this country never bother to think about. A commitment to make others whole with our own success. And yes, that means sacrificing our own wealth once we become people of means. However, there is a massive roadblock to this private, non-governmental approach to making people whole to enacting justice. That is the unrealized and abusive use of laws meant to create equality through the use of the second sense of justice, punishment. People already are trying to make the unequal demographics of society whole through private, non-governmental means, but frequently come under attack for doing so. Hate crime prosecutions are more frequently sentenced on minority demographic defendants than majority or plurality demographic defendants. People demand that scholarships for black students or female students be available to whites and men. Private schools and businesses who engage in affirmative action, policies that purposefully create systems to counteract subconscious bias, are attacked by outrage against currently non-existent quota systems. The empowered demographics of society use the punitive power of the courts to obstruct private citizens from trying to realize that third sense of justice, which the courts invented but are unable to actualize. In 2017, the first major Hollywood movie with both a female lead actress and a female director debuted, Wonder Woman. And one theater decided to celebrate the historic occasion with a women-only showing, staffed entirely by women, and accepting an audience of only people who identify as female. Immediately, this theater comes under attack by thousands of men on social media, criticizing the theater for discrimination against men. And, almost as quickly, lawsuits filed against the theater for the same prior to any evidence of male employees suffering any loss of hours or pay or any legitimate claims by men to have been barred from seeing the film because of their sex. 
When private citizens and businesses try to realize the third sense of justice to make a historically unequal group whole to some abstract extent, the historically empowered group raises a call of how dare you attack us. We gave you the equality you sought. We changed the law to not allow the direct inequality of the past. You have justice. Are you not satisfied? No. Of course we're not satisfied. The changing of the law only fulfills the first sense of justice, of taking a state of affairs that ought not be, that are bad, and changing the rule to a state that is good, that ought to be. But that is only one third of the equation that makes up our sense of justice, and it is the easiest and least complex part of the equation. Just stop doing the bad thing. Don't start from a position of accepting inequality as good. This is the easiest step in the three senses of justice our society has established. And yet it took our country more than 150 years to do just that much for racial inequality and even longer for women. Would you be satisfied if you were only allowed to eat one third of the meal you ordered at a restaurant? Of course not. Our country is nowhere near realizing the second sense of justice with regards to inequality. As long as the second sense of justice is enforced in a way that further entrenches the inequality that the first sense of justice laws were meant to stop. Our country will never realize the second sense of justice if it continues on that path. As long as the second sense of justice is used to hinder the work of private citizens and businesses to realize the third sense of justice, to make whole the people harmed by inequality, we will never realize the third sense of justice in our society either. Eventually, people will try to force their equality if it is not freely given. That is the truth of history that has played out dozens and dozens of times in numerous countries. And no one will be satisfied. No one will feel equal until they have not just a piece of justice, but of all three senses of justice. Full and complete justice. But maybe everything I have said here just blew past your caring. Perhaps you don't care about equality at all. If that's the case, I cannot help you. But perhaps you don't believe that equality is actually real, and thus negating everything I have said here. If this is the case, then we can talk. So on my next philosophy, I want to talk about equality itself, the different kinds of equality, and how they work. I hope you'll join me for that one as well. It'll premiere in just a couple weeks. Thank you for listening, my friends. Thank you for joining me for this, admittedly, emotional, and very controversial podcast that I've posted. As a reminder, I use philosophies for getting out some small philosophical ideas of mine that I don't often get to discuss and that I typically can't tie to any video games or anime that I want to analyze. As I have said before, these are not fully fleshed out ideas, but I do hope you find them interesting, and part of the reason for putting them up is so that we can discuss them more and reach that point of fleshing them out. If you did enjoy this video, please subscribe to the channel and share with your friends. Though I would suggest that you share one of the more entertaining video game or anime videos. I hope to see you next time, and as always, stay true.